event. Uh, and so I want to say welcome and thank you all for joining today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I am joining from uh, the east end of Toronto, which is the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabewaki peoples, uh, and part of the Williams Treaties, um, the most recent one in 1923. So uh, one of the things I'm doing around um, my land acknowledgement is um, learning what I can about the Williams Treaties to understand the intent behind them, where we are today, and you know how how best to honor honor those. Um, so uh, I leave that with you to to uh, think about and perhaps. Um, uh learn learn about where you are uh if that's part of your journey toward reconciliation um as folks have joined us uh we we are recording this as i said earlier to ensure that folks who can't be with us today can see it and for anybody who wants to uh see it again they have that opportunity um we have muted all participants to minimize uh background noise so if you do have questions as we go along uh, please do put those in the chat and we will um, take a look at that at the end. Um, and uh, with that, I think maybe we will uh, carry on with the um, actual meat of our presentation today. So um, we called this uh, session things to think about, things to consider when investing. And so I'm just going to do a brief introduction about the foundation and, and why we're, we're offering this. Uh, and then we'll move into talking about the long-term funds that make up uh, our investments, investment policy statements, how we uh, think about values in terms of our investing, some options or opportunities that are available with and through the foundation, um, and then other ways that we may be able to uh, assist, other ways we might be able to help. So um, I think uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions in there as well. And um, we'll I'll just, uh, we'll get going then. The foundation was created in uh, 2002. So we celebrated our 20th anniversary yesterday, uh, yesterday last year. Um, and our purpose is to provide uh, services for all courts of the church. Um, Con congregations, communities of faith, regions, general counsel office, um, and to think about long-term capacity, um, particularly um, through the attraction and deployment of financial resources. So we are aligned with uh, the deep, bold, daring vision of the, of the general counsel, um, and really focused on capacity building grant making, careful stewardship of our of, uh, funds entrusted to us. We have, uh, the foundation has named four areas of focus, uh, anti-racism, climate justice, communities of faith and reconciliation. Um, and we um, are striving to show those priorities in all of our work from our, how we do our work to our granting and our investing. Um, and when we think about the services we offer, like I was saying, it's for the whole church, so it's for individuals in terms of creating long-term support for the ministries they care about, for communities of faith and congregations uh, who are doing uh, amazing work across the country, and um, uh, and for, uh, again, for congregations, communities of faith who are um, looking for assistance with uh, long-term fund or investment management. We also offer a short-term giving program where folks can donate gifts of securities like stocks and mutual funds. Uh, and we uh, facilitate uh, um, a, about $5 million a year of gifts like that, mostly going out to congregations across the country. So also happy to help with that. Uh, but the the bulk of our work is spent on long-term giving, um, so creating endowments or other long-term trusts, working with uh, individuals to set up uh, gifts in their will, things to support um, long-term 
ministry and work of the church. From that work, we have built up funds that are um, somewhat general in purpose and can be used to make grants, most famously through our Seeds of Hope program, um, which is open right now and accepting applications until April 15th. Um, and so those are for programs, projects, ministries that benefit the United Church in some way, that are innovative, encourage new um, expressions of ministry, um, and that will strengthen the capacity of organizations, congregations, camps, communities of faith uh, within the church. Um, we also offer some scholarships and academic awards for folks studying uh, to become our future leaders um, and, and um, those who have done some research uh, who, that will inform the future of the church. And of course, all of that is supported by our investments. Um, the foundation, as of uh, December 31st, has um, just over 90 million with, um, that we have invested with two fund managers. The bulk of our investments are with Fiera Capital. We have a smaller portfolio with Genes Capital Management, both of which are Canadian firms. And in that 90 uh, th uh, million uh, investment, that's made up of 415 endowments uh, and another 410 restricted funds. Um, and so that's where the, the granting comes from. And that's where our experience with investment management uh, comes in. And so that's... Um, you know, one of our commitments is to share our experience in our learnings um, with congregations, with communities of faith across the country to, to um, help wherever we can. And so, you know, we'll see, you can see from the slide that, uh, as you might have expected, 2020 was uh, a tough year in terms of investments. Um, but in the long term, uh, the five year and 10 year uh, rates of return are still quite strong. Um, and enable us to uh, continue to make meaningful grants to ministries across the country. Um, so long-term funds, endowments, and um, restricted trusts, or trusts as, as some people call them, are not, um, not for immediate use in their whole. They are... Uh, usually have a specific purpose, they're usually invested, and sometimes, like in the case of endowments, only the income can be spent. Um, and so of the of the funds that the the foundation has, um, you know, it's about 50-50. And um the the when I say they're not for immediate use is that there's they're meant to be spent over time. So the endowments, only a portion of the income is spent, and in the other restricted trusts, it's either, you know, a specific percentage or an amount every year that goes out, but there's, um, the gift is meant to be spent over the long term, which we um, uh, consider to be more than five years. When it comes to thinking about who's responsible for the long-term funds, the endowments, the other assets of, uh, of an organization, when it's a congregation, it's a combination of the trustees and the congregation. When it's um, another ministry or community of faith, it's often called the board of directors for the foundation. It's our board of directors uh, work and they uh, have an investment committee made up of investment professionals uh, from across the country who um, help oversee the, the management and the um, good stewardship of those assets. We um, think about being prudent investors when we think about being responsible for funds that are entrusted to us. Um, that donors so generously give. And that just means that we need to take care um, that we're not being too, um, that, we're, that we're not, that we don't have too much risk in our investments and that we are taking the same level of care that we would take for our own. 
And now if folks have particular experience, they're held to a higher standard of care, like investment professionals, for example, would have a higher duty of care in terms of managing or uh, overseeing investments uh, than somebody who doesn't. Which reminds me at this point, I should say, um, I'm not an investment professional. I'm not actually giving investment advice, but I'm just, I'm sharing our learning experience um, and would be happy to connect you to folks who can provide that kind of advice if that's uh, of interest. So very important to the foundation and to all investors in terms of managing their assets, their investments, their long-term funds is the investment policy statement. I mean, is this, that's the guiding document that tells us um, how much risk we're, we are willing to tolerate how long we are investing our our assets for, whether or not we're incorporating values into that, and how we're going to um, evaluate uh, the success really of of these investments and any manager that we might uh, engage to help us with that. And so these documents are really key. They don't have to be complicated or you know incredibly long but they do need to lay out some of the basics um, to, to guide whoever is overseeing the investments. So a lot of um, um, congregations, communities of faith, and nonprofit organizations, charities in general, tend to be fairly risk averse. And so we need to find that balance between um, how, how much we are wanting the assets or investments to grow versus how much um, um, we can tolerate when, you know, we have an economic downturn or results aren't as good as they were last year. You know, what's that comfort level? Um, and and that will be different for, for most congregations. The foundation is, um, you know, we could consider it to have a medium risk tolerance. And uh, so that means that, um, you know, we're willing, we're, we're looking for some growth from our portfolio um, and we're willing to tolerate some uh, negative returns in, in um, economic environments like we're currently in, uh, but that we want to be really careful because we have this duty to protect our endowments um, so that we're not losing the original uh, gift. So we, we have to find that balance with our risk and the foundation um, has settled on sort of what the uh, industry professionals would call like a medium risk tolerance. The time horizon is really important too. Are you investing, um, you know, funds for uh, capital work for your building that you know you're going to spend in three years time? That's a different kind of investment uh, than if you're looking at um, holding the in the the investments for for a long time, ten plus years, five to ten plus years. Um, you know, that's an important piece of information for whoever is overseeing your um, uh, your assets, your investments. So sorting out the portion that you might need access to sooner or on a more regular basis versus the, the part that you're going to leave in there for the long term. And that, uh, the risk and the time horizon um, contribute to determining um, your target rate of return for your portfolio. So the foundation has said overall, we want between a five and an eight percent return on an annual basis. So you can see over the long term, our results are supporting that. Um, that you know, on average, our return will be somewhere between five to eight percent. And I should say that the past few years, until 2022, we actually had our returns were double digit. And so we far exceeded that, um, our, our target return, which means that in an environment like we're in now, we have a bit of a cushion to manage um, when those returns are less. Um, so depending on, on your needs and the purpose of the endowments or tr trusts or long-term funds that you have, um, that the risk, the time horizon, and your target return are really important to um, 
agree on um, and to share with your investment manager to have in your policy statement. Something that's a little, um, should we say, perhaps softer for the policy statement is whether or not you want to incorporate values into the policy. So ESG stands for Enviro Environmental, Social, and Governance, and then understood as the word factors. So environmental, social, and governance factors. Um, whether or not you want to state clearly that you want your investment manager, whoever's looking after your investments, to incorporate the, um, those factors into the investments and whether or not beyond that you have specific values that you want to be incorporated. Um, and so those, those pieces um, require sort of more discussion amongst yourself. If you're going to include them, what are those values going to be? Um, and um, and then you know the expression of of how you how you want your manager or whoever's overseeing to incorporate that into your investment strategy. And coming along with that then is, you know, what are you going to do? How often are you going to assess uh, how the manager or the portfolio is performing? And um, what would be the steps to make any changes either to the policy statement itself or to the investment relationship or, you know, composition of your portfolio. So those are the, the, the prime things to um, really think hard about and discuss and um, ensure are reflected in a, in a written statement of how you want your investments to be managed. Um, and I, I just, I wanna take a few minutes to say a little bit more about ESG and SRI uh, and investing in values alignment. So when I first started with the foundation, which was um, 16 years ago, uh, we talked about SRI or socially responsible investments and uh, how important that was for us at the time. So, and at that time, there was still a question of if you take a socially responsible investing lens or structure to your, to your investments, um, will you actually be compromising your returns? And you know, hindsight is 2020, and the research shows that no, when you, you know, when we had that socially responsible investment policy, our returns were as good, sometimes better, than um, other portfolios that hadn't taken those things into account. So socially responsible investing um, is often thought of in terms of screens, so positive and negative screens. Uh, positive screens, we want these kind of investments in our portfolio, like clean tech, for example, um, you, that would be a positive screen. A negative screen would be, um, we don't want any coal in our portfolio, or um, you know, we don't want any alcohol or tobacco or gaming in our portfolio, so screen those out. So that was sort of um, the conversation around socially responsible uh, investing. 15, 16 years ago. And since then, it's sort of shifted into these environmental, social, and governance factors and how they play into investments. And the majority of uh, investment managers these days have some sort of statement saying that they take ESG into account. And uh, so they all they they would to to varying degrees. And what we're really talking about here is looking at the overall impact of a company on the uh, community that it's working in, on the environment, um, how it uh, as an organization uh, pays attention to things like pay equity or uh, diversity and the board and management. Um, and the, I will say my personal opinion is that I would not, for me personally, um, and we don't in the foundation, use a manager who did not take 
environmental, social, and governance factors into account uh, because one of the things those factors tend to do is actually decrease risk. So you're finding companies that have more solid operations, better uh, plans for the future, do um, less harm to the environment, um, treat their workers well, et cetera. So it's not the be all and end all. You can't be guaranteed that just because a manager or a portfolio is viewed from an, um, an environmental, social, or governance angle that you're necessarily getting ethical investments, but you are most likely getting investments that have less risk because the companies are, have solid operations um, and plans. So um, it has been uh, since the beginning, very important for the foundation to incorporate these factors into our investing. And um, almost two years ago now, we went uh, a step further to start having conversations about um, our priorities, our, the anti-racism, care for climate, um, and reconciliation in particular in terms of our investing. Uh, we added a, a fourth one. We and um, since we can't really uh, focus on communities of faith in our investing at this point, what we're focusing on is rural community development, primarily in Canada. And um, we started having conversations with Fiera, who holds the bulk of our investments, about what that looks like in our, what is a fairly traditional portfolio, stocks, bonds, other fixed income, um, Canadian, U.S., international equities. So, you know, a pretty normal portfolio um, for, for a foundation or a charitable organization. So conversations with them about what's that going to look like? Because with Fiera, we hold pooled funds. So we're not picking and choosing our stocks or our bonds or our mutual funds or what have you. We're, you know, we're invested in um, a, a fund that they have created Um and so, you know, being sure to get information on from them about how they're thinking about those environment and social and governance pieces. Are they thinking about reconciliation? How are they reflecting climate, et cetera, in our, in our investments? And then we carved out $5 million to do impact investing. Um, which is investing that gives us some a financial return, but then some other kind of return on top of that, like a social or environmental um, return, as we can think of it. And um, we put that those that five million with uh, Genes Capital, based in Vancouver. Um, and the reasons we went that route was because when you look at what we do as a foundation. Now we're mandated by the CRA to Canada Revenue Agency to give out at least 5% of our assets every year. And um, that leaves 95 sitting with our fund managers, 95% of our assets sitting with our fund managers. And that's a lot of money. So we wanted to make sure that it's in alignment with, with our, our goals and our purposes and our, our purpose for doing God's work um, and, and uh, not in conflict with that, but actually um, doing more with that um, and complementing or enhancing our granting priorities as well as meeting our financial obligations, but but being able to take this extra step to make sure that all of our assets are working together to do God's work. Um, this is a fairly busy slide, uh, but I wanted to share with you three of the um, investments we have in that portfolio as examples of, of how our investments are actually working towards um towards our in our in our in our priority areas and so on the on the top of the screen there you can see the raven uh indigenous um fund now, raven is um an indigenous led and owned investment firm and they support indigenous entrepreneurs 
And uh, so we have uh, we have an investment uh, in their business, uh, in their work. And um, they also measure things, as you can see, like the number of female or non-binary uh, founders they have. And they're going to uh, target 50% of the investment to support those those folks. Um, so that that's one. That's one of our um, ways of incorporating reconciliation into our portfolio. Uh, and the other one at the top of the screen is windmill microloans. And what windmill does is provide loans to um, immigrants and newcomers to have their accreditations recognized in Canada. And so the first metric they talk about is the income um, multiplier. So once somebody is accredited, how much does their income increase compared to what it was before they had their Canadian accreditation. And you can see that their income there increases uh, by uh, just over 3%, or th sorry, three times, 3%, three times, um, which is huge. Um, and similarly, the folks who, uh, you know, get the loan to get their Canadian accreditation, their, um, prior to having the loan, there's about a 41% unemployment rate. And after they repay the loan, there's a 7%. So that's a huge decrease in unemployment or a huge increase in employment, if we want to look at it from that, the positive side. Um, and you can see from the loan growth that they are, the number of loans is growing significantly year over year, and their repayment rate is 98%, I believe. So that's huge. And that's um, one of the, the ways we're incorporating anti-racism into our um, uh, portfolio. And the, the last one there is uh, about um, environment. And so they are in, in Lancis is doing really interesting things around um, uh, carbon markets and, and decreasing, you know, atmosphere, uh, carbon release and that kind of thing. And so they want to take out 24 million tons of greenhouse gases. That's essentially what they're looking at. And um, that's so that's an example of how we are uh, incorporating care for climate into our um, into our portfolio. Um, so I just I offer that as sort of uh, information on ways to think about values in in your portfolio. Um, and, um, I'm always happy to talk more about that with anybody one-on-one. -on -one. That's like one of my favorite topics. <laughs> so, um, uh, if you want to talk more about that, uh, feel free to reach out for sure. Um, so where I want to, where I want to go now is to the options, uh, or opportunities, um, that we can offer around investing, um, and to, to sort of differentiate between, um, what's out there for for you for communities of faith for congregations there's what i would call high intensity or self-directed investing where um your trustees or your finance and investment committee are actually picking stocks investments pooled funds what have you for your organization to invest in so it's a lot of time and oversight research expertise required for that so high intensity Medium intensity is where you would um, hire a fund manager to do that work on your behalf. And then low intensity is where the foundation comes in, uh, where we take care of almost almost everything uh, for you. Um, and so um, in terms of, of what we offer, we have... Um, a number of congregations, camps, community ministries that have created funds within the foundation. And um, so we do all the investing, we do the reporting, um, we send grants on a, at a regularly scheduled uh, time that we agree upon. Um, and, and we basically take on all the management of, of the investing uh, for, those, um, for those groups. And then uh, we have a, what we call um, affiliation relationships with uh, Frontier Capital, 
Jenna's Capital and Fiera Capital um, to uh, for congregations who feel more comfortable dealing directly with the fund manager. Um, those are three of the options. So Frontier is a Calgary-based fund um, manager, and they um, they work with congregations, uh, communities of faith, um, and provide discounted management fee. Um, and they pretty much, you know, if you have five thousand dollars you want to invest, if you have fifty thousand, hundred thousand, whatever the number is, um, they're happy to to work with you on that. Uh, Jenna's Capital is, I mentioned before, based in Vancouver, and they have a 250,000 um, minimum investment, um, and they really focus on uh, things like fossil fuel free investments and other theme investments. They're particularly strong around environmentally um, focused investments, um, and they, uh, they also offer discounted management fee. And then uh, Fiera's private wealth team is happy to talk with congregations, communities of faith, organizations that have uh, over a million dollars to to invest. Um, and uh, then you get very similar investments to to what the foundation holds with them. Um, and uh, again, discounted management fee. So um, as part of the follow up to this uh, webinar, we'll send you some details on all four of those things so you can have those. Um, we'll hope to get that out within the next week or two. And uh, again, always happy if you want to send us an email or give us a call to talk more about any of those pieces. Um, and then um, as I come to the the end of, of what uh, I plan to say today and and as you think about any questions you might want to put in the chat there um, that we can we can talk about the other ways that we can help is we can offer the foundation can help is that we can offer um, sample policies like uh, investment policies or um, fund management or gift acceptance policies um, legacy or plan giving policies, which often are the source of endowments or long term funds in congregations, communities of faith. Um, and, uh, and, and we can connect you with other resources around grants, around uh, financial stewardship, around property uh, issues and management. Um, and if there's anything that I haven't mentioned, but that you're curious about, that's the other, you're always welcome to, to reach out and, uh, and have a conversation. So um, one of the, um, here's, our, here's our contact information. Um, and um, if you have any questions, now, now would be the time. Um, and I think, um, when I think about uh, some of the most frequently asked questions um, that we get, they tend to be around um, returns. Uh, and so we can provide you uh, more specific information on returns uh, for those of you who are interested in that. Um, and uh, beyond that, often it's um, there's questions around um how how to how to set up policies that that support your long-term fund management so um i will stop uh screen sharing and uh and uh i just wonder if there are any uh questions um folks have for us Um, so uh, we had a question about the benchmark, and that's that's a great question. The benchmark is blended, so it's a combination of um, MSCI World, of um, TSX, of um, yeah. There's three or four components there that I can uh, uh, that I can that we'll make sure we include in the in the follow up. So you've got the the proper details. Absolutely. Um, and then um, we have a question about 
um, which investment platforms do we have for perpetual care funds? Um, so I think that's another way of saying endowment funds. And so the foundation is happy to help manage those. And then um, any of the affiliate managers can also do the same. They just, uh, because in that case, it's entirely on to the congregation or community of faith to ensure that you're managing those funds consistent with the purpose um, that they were given for. So it, hopefully, Barb, that answers your question. Um, if not, we can we can uh, connect offline and, and figure that out. Um, and so, uh, Ted, that's a very great question. Ted has asked, in a year when investment returns are negative, what happens uh, about income that a congregation can receive? So um, in the foundation's case, uh, Canada Revenue Agency, they mandate that we give away at least 5% of the equivalent of 5% of our assets. Um, they also say that to calculate that 5%, we should use the average value over the prior two years. So in 2023, we'll be making grants um, based on all of 2021 and 2022. And the thing about that is that in 2021, our um, rate of return was just over 10%. And so, or 13, maybe 13%. So, you know, the average then still gives us um, positive room. If, you know, 2023 carries on and returns are great, um, we're still taking the average balance uh, and uh, of each fund and granting based on that. So. Um, what that relies on is buildup of capital from, from prior years. For a community of faith that is uh, has its own investments, um, even in a year where there are negative returns, if you have a portfolio that has a mix of different kinds of investments in it, you probably have uh, realized income that's actual cash into the account, either from dividends or, uh, you know, uh, bonds or GICs that have matured, and then you know those. That's sort of the income types of income you could use um, to uh, to fund uh, ministry work. Um, the um, there's a question from Ed about the process to withdraw funds, um, and um, the 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 whether or not the foundation pays out annual income. So yes, um, every year we make grants. Uh, most organizations that we make grants to are prefer a once a year lump sum. There's a couple um, that prefer to have quarterly. And so we work that out amongst ourselves with what that schedule is gonna look like and, and how that's gonna work. Um, and then uh, to withdraw funds, um, we need, uh, in, in so there's an in each case with the foundation we have an agreement that says uh, stipulates how grants are going to be handled, um, and uh, so that can be really particular. It can be you know on a quarterly basis we will send um, monies, or it can just be you know uh, we'll send monies once a year with no stip no like additional to it. Um, so there's sort of that that regular way of managing grants. And then if there's an instance where additional funds are needed for whatever reason, um, we just need something in writing and then we need um, a few days pretty much to get the money to you. It takes uh, the standard investment. Uh, time to withdraw from the inv investments is usually um, they've shortened it, but usually it ends up being, you know, three days before the, the money hits your bank account. And then we just need that one more to get the money out. Those are really excellent questions. Thank you, folks. We had a lot of time, so we could talk about <laughs> lots of different things here. Um, but um, the management expense ratio. So the foundation um, just charges a, a flat 
fee. And it, it does depend on the size of the investment, but the maximum amount is one and a half percent over the course of the year. And so we calculate that quarterly based on the, the average balance of, uh, of a fund. Um, so it's not really a management expense ratio or MER per se. It's more of just like that flat fee for uh, managing all the ins and outs. And, um, and, uh, and that covers the investment fee that the foundation pays to our, to our managers. Any other questions folks are wondering about? I am, oh. Um, okay, so uh, Jennifer has asked, are there some sectors that congregations try to stay away from? Um, yeah, yes, generally speaking, there's, there's a few, um, and then it is up to each congregation to, to decide, um, what's important to them. So yeah, uh, you named, um, um, you named arms, for example, so weapons manufacturing. Um, and I should say, when we think about all of this, the other thing to think about is, um, is the tolerance to it. So how much of an organization of a company's um, revenue is tied to that particular thing, for example. Um, so would you have like a minimum threshold of 10, 10% uh, of, of uh, revenue from, uh, from a certain um, activity means absolutely no investing or is it an absolute zero tolerance? Um, so yes, arms, weapons manufacturing is one. Uh, some congregations named nuclear is another thing to stay out of. Um, there's a whole bunch around energy that folks um, uh, discussion uh, have discussions about, be that uh, coal or um, gas or oil or you know. And then you have to think about if you're going that route, if you if you want to do something like fossil fuel free. Are you also thinking about the infrastructure that goes along with that? Um, there are uh, congregations that choose to stay away from extractive industries like mining. Um, there are things around uh, pornography, alcohol, gaming um, that often are excluded from portfolios. Um, uh, we can make sure that there is um, um, some of the more common ones are included in the follow-up that we send from um, uh, from this webinar, but that gives you a, a sense. Um, do uh, Barb is asking if foundation clients receive reports on performance, including Morningstar reports. So we don't include Morningstar reports, but we do give um, detailed reports on. Uh, investments, gains or losses, you know, types of income, um, grants in, uh, donations in, um, the fees that we charge. So that is all um, provided uh, to folks investing with the, in the foundation. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I assume the Morningstar is to uh, compare on how, how, the foundation's investment management is going uh, compared to other um, other managers, other you know, sort of the the standard. Um, and uh, we do have information on that as well, but it's not like a Morningstar specific report. Um, the and then somebody, Lori, has asked if a congregation invests with the foundation, can it designate a specific fund? Um, and at this point, no, all of our investments are pooled, so all managed together. Um, as we 
as we grow and as we get more sophisticated with our learning, we're still relatively new about the whole impact piece, then uh, we may be able to move to uh, something like that. Um, and it's certainly worth a con uh, continued conversation um, around how we might make that available to folks uh, because it depends, but often impact investments in particular have um, each investment would have a threshold minimum that you'd have to meet, which can be fairly high. It just depends on the investment. So wanting to find ways to make that more accessible um, is a conversation we have regularly with Genesis Capital. Um, so let's keep in touch on that. Um, uh, Karen has asked how soon the recording will be available. Um, and I would say within a week. Um, that we'll have that to you. And then we actually have a question on uh, grants and the criteria for being awarded. And so there are um, there are uh, different criteria depending on on what it is you're you want to do. So I would uh, encourage you to go to the foundation's website and we have a uh, quite a detailed section on Seeds of Hope granting and then, and also on the scholarship and academic awards. Um, but basically um, looking for, you know, just sort of in big picture stuff that um, there's buy-in from the congregation, uh, community of faith um, for the project, that um, you are trying something new, um, new for you uh, that is of service um, to your community of faith or the community that you're operating in um, and that there are plans to um, like kind of evaluate how that's going um, uh, and how and the results of your project um, and um, also that um, Sorry, it's not a hard. It's not a hard question to answer. Also, uh, that you're thinking about whether or not this is an ongoing thing or it's a one-time, time-limited piece, um, and how you're going to manage either the wrap-up or the carry-forward of that project. Anything else I can help folks with this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are? <laughs> All right, well, once again, I would invite you to reach out to the foundation with any questions that bubble up around this or any specifics that you have around your particular situation that you'd like to chat with uh, with me or one of the team about. I very much appreciate you all uh, making time for this today um, and, and for, for being here with us. And um, we will get you out that recording and the follow-up information that I have promised um, as soon as we can. Thank you very much. And um, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.